Father, we ask the Lord, the entrance of your word this morning, we again give light to our heart and understanding to our minds in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This morning I want to conclude the message I started last week, uh, which is, uh, are you the enemy of the cross? And I remember last week I spoke profusely to the fact that so, though some people are a member of the body of Christ, are a member of the church, but their lives is, is as though they are enemies of God. That it is possible to be in church and yet the life you live suggests to God that you are an enemy and not a daughter or a son. And what we established last week was that uh, it is God's design to function according to the estimate uh, that he has concerning us. What I mean by estimate, if God has called us sons, if God has called us daughters, if we are a member of his family, then he expects that we live a life that corresponds with that identity and not live as though we are, a, um, uh, we are uh, betraying the life into which he has called us. And last week, we emphasized from scriptures, according to Philippians 3, that um, from verse 17 to 21, that Paul was saying that many indeed in the church are living as enemies of God. I want us to go back to that scripture so that I can build you know, my message this morning within the context that we started. Though my emphasis is not what it was last week, my emphasis today is how do we live as um, the friend of the cross of Christ? That is, how do we live a life that is uh, consistent with the, uh, with the cross of Jesus? I'm reading from Philippians 3, 17 to 21, again this morning, just for context. Say, dear brothers and sisters, can you see that the scripture began by calling you brothers and sisters because that is the perception of God uh, towards you. He said, dear brothers and sisters, is a pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. He said, pattern your life after mine. And I always like to say to people, to I like just said, as your pastor, I'm sure I've lived a life, you know, by the grace of God that, that could be emulated in some ways or the other. They said, pattern your life after mine. Verse 18, it says, For I have told you before many times, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. God did not call these people evil people. He was making reference to their conduct. That though they are a brother, they are a sister. But their conduct and the pattern of their lives suggests to God to the point of tears in his eyes that this is living as an enemy of the cross of Christ. And why God is in tears concerning them is in verse 19. He says they are headed for destruction. He said they are headed for destruction. I pray for you this morning that you will not head for destruction. Minded the fact that they are living as an enemy of the cross, I see their destiny as destruction. It says, Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they think only about this life here on earth. He said, But we are citizens of heaven. We are the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly awaiting for his return as Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into a glorious body like his own. You did the same power with which um, it will bring everybody and everything under control. Now this is Jesus speaking here. He says with tears I'm saying that there are some people whose conduct suggests to heaven they are enemy of this cross. And last week we looked into several things you know, that suggest to God that we are his enemy and not his friend, that we are his, you know, uh, antagonists, and not his sons and daughters, and we looked at self-centeredness, we looked like shameful behaviors, shameful 
positions, things that we wear before we confessed that we want to belong to the kingdom of God, things that we used to do that we ought to have left behind now that we are in a new kingdom that we are still holding on to. The Bible calls them shameful behaviors shameful attitude, shameful disposition, that when it comes to the light of, uh, when it comes to the public, uh, we are shameful about them. He said, those are the people that what they do in secret, they can't be proud about it in the open. He said, such people live as enemies of the cross. And we look at art mindedness being outrightly art-centered. And the Bible says that such men, they are destined for destruction. But this morning, I want to speak to the topic, which is a subset of what we considered last week, how to bear the cross of Jesus on a daily basis. Our destiny as God's people, as we follow Christ every day, is to carry his cross and follow him faithfully. How do we carry our cross? I decided to reference that portion of scripture in the book of Daniel chapter 2, that our sister read to us how, you know, some set of people, though they were in a strange land, on that severe and difficult condition, still able to stand as a friend of God, to stand with God, regardless of what was coming upon them. That story, I don't know if you followed it, was the story of, a, um, uh, of sons of the kingdom of Israel, those that profess allegiance to God. And the condition and the profession of their faith was brought to test by fire. And the Bible says that a king, being incited by certain men, set up a fire, a fiery furnace, and said, nobody must, you know, bow to any other thing but this golden image. And whoever that does not bow to this golden image will be thrown inside the fire that have set up. I'm sure it was not only Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There were Israelites that were in that kingdom. What happened to the rest of them? Eh? They bowed down. They were in their numbers. But this man said, no. This is a cross we must carry. Me, we will carry it. This is a cross we must carry. We will carry it. And they carried the cross. To the point of entering the fire together with it. They carried the cross and they entered the fire together with it. And the Bible says that God did not look at them with pity. Ah, that what this guy was about, is about to carry is too much for them. Let me rescue them. He didn't, he didn't rescue them on the way. He rescued them inside the fire. That is, God most times wanted to see the extent and how far you can go with your profession of faith. You are under financial pressure and you pray for provision. You think that God, God will just answer and supply and just whatever. But what you are likely to face is temptation, you know, to steal. God will be waiting. Will this person steal even if I don't end up providing for him? Will this person go ahead and compromise even if I do nothing about the situation? He wants to see how you are able to carry your cross. How you are able to carry the cross. And my emphasis this morning is that how do we carry the cross and follow Jesus on a daily basis? Because that's this design. And where we read in the book of Mark, he said, who is he that wants to be my disciple? What's the quality that he says you must have? He said, you must be ready to what? Carry your cross and follow me. How do we carry the cross of Christ? Number one, you must be ready to deny yourself for the sake of Christ. One of the greatest enemies of the cross of Christ is self. And if we effectively carry this cross, we must be ready and willing to deny self. To bear the cross of Christ, you must be ready to deny personal desires and kill self-centered appetite and ambition that conflict with the will of Christ. The battle that most of us face on a daily basis is a conflict between what we desire and what God desires. 
is a conflict between our appetite and the will of God. It is normal for a matured man, a mature woman, to have appetite for immorality. But we know that appetite is an ungodly appetite if we satisfy it. The Bible says that stolen water is sweet. It doesn't want to drink something sweet. But because stolen water is sweet, must it mean that you drink it? No. We must be ready to deny our personal desires. Some of these desires may be legitimate desires. Things that we can justify. Things that we can explain. Things that we can rationalize. But if we will follow Christ and carry his cross, we must be able to deny ourselves. I give an example in Philippians chapter 2. From verse 9. The scripture says that though Christ himself was equal with God, but he did not consider his equality with God, but rather became obedience to the death of the cross. The Bible says that the dying of the cross. That is, it is not illegitimate for Christ to claim deity when he walked on earth, but for a greater purpose and a greater priority. The Bible says that he denied his deity so that he can go through to death of the cross. What happened after he went through that? Therefore, he said, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is what? Above every other name. Self-denial is one of the fundamental requirements if we must follow Jesus. Luke 9, 23, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow. Forgiving somebody that offends you so badly is self-denial. Because you will have every form of justification to hold on to a heart. There's a whole lot of stuff that we can deny ourselves so that we can gain the glory of God. Excuse me. The root of every sin is lack of self-denial. Sin preys on the desires for self-gratification to hold off into bondage. So if a man will live above sin, he must be a man that is ready to kill himself to gain the cross of Jesus. When I'm talking about killing, I'm not talking about suicide here. I'm talking about putting under subjection all that the Bible says that you put under subjection. Colossians chapter 5, somebody should read from verse 3 for me. Colossians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3 from verse 5, sorry. He said, put to death therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Please, is it compulsory you read King James? Is that put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nation? Sexual immorality? Impurity? Lust? Evil desires? Greed? Which is adultery? Be willing to give up comfort and convenience 
but it is a place to support them. That is, it is not comfortable, but because it is this God and it is this Christ, I must do it. This might involve sacrificing your time. This might involve sacrificing your resources. This might involve sacrificing your energy. Sacrificial living. And I think what it was last week I was emphasizing, I was trying to describe what it means to be a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 says the only reasonable thing that God receives in the New Testament is a living sacrifice. That the only thing that is holy, the only thing that is pleasing, the only thing that is acceptable is back to me. Just leave it the way it is. I will end up very soon. And there is no sacrifice without willingness to offer oneself, one's life. And I want to say this, when service starts, even the media department, don't touch anything. Just come early for service. This should have been done before service starts. It's causing all of this. Everybody is hot. Because they are not living a sacrificial life. You wake up by 9 o'clock. When service starts at 9 o'clock, you will not be distracting service up and down. This is what we are talking. They are not carrying that cross. Carrying the cross means that 6 30 you are here. Test everything. Is that not what you see? And I want to speak to workers here. Please, it might happen going forward from next week. If you are a worker, you don't attend workers' meeting. You cannot pay that sacrifice. Then you cannot serve. We should have standards. If it is Christ we are serving, some of the choir members will be coming in at 9.30 to 10. And you want to serve God. What kind of sacrifice is that? If you are going to club, some of you that attend club, do you go there before, before it starts? We can't continue to offer God unreasonable service. It's not pleasing to him. This applies to ministers. If it is sacrifice, or if it is Christ you want to serve, then give him a living sacrifice, not dead one. The Old Testament God may receive dead sacrifice from you, but now is demanding for a living sacrifice. It's a higher level of sacrifice. It's a higher level. So if you must carry the cross of Christ, you must embrace a sacrificial lifestyle. You must. You must be ready to give your time to the things by which you profess Christ. You must be ready to give your resources. You must be ready to give up even your body, if need be. If need be. It says in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, it says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. There's a common saying that says, if anything is worth doing, is worth doing what? Where? What is the essence of doing things that you are not doing well? That is called mediocrity. And there are many mediocres calling themselves believers today. It is mediocrity not to be able to give your life for service. In the name of Christ. And when I'm talking about service, I'm not limiting it to the scope of the church. How much time of yours did you sacrifice in a week to expand this kingdom that you claim you belong to? If the kingdom is attractive to you in any way. How many people in the past seven days did you engage with the gospel? Say, come. Your soul is so precious to me and to Christ. Let me show you the way of the Lord. Or we are just self-centered, myopic, and self-focused. All we chase for the past seven days is everything that concerns me, myself, and I. That is not how to carry the cross. How many lives has your life impacted this week? If it has impacted one, I congratulate you. But if you have not at any way, at any point, share your faith with the purpose of adding to the kingdom of God this week, then shame on you. You are not living the life that, you know, Christ can commend. You are not carrying that cross. You are saved to serve. You are saved to expand the kingdom. The kingdom of God can only grow when the members of that kingdom are responsible. May I say without any sense of apology 
that there are many irresponsible Christians today. Very irresponsible Christians. The kingdom of God and the urgency of this kingdom does not bother you at all. May I say to you, in case you are not aware, that we live in the end time. And the calendar of God is about to close. If you have been following news, you will understand what is happening in the international landscape. I was in a meeting yesterday and a woman of God reminded us of a certain truth. That if you want to know whether prophecy are fulfilled or being fulfilled, say, look at the nation of Israel. That Israel is God's prophetic clock for the end time. The stage is set and the dice is casted. Those who are not aware of what is going on will be caught unawares when he returns. Look at what scripture we read in Mark chapter 8. He said, those who are ashamed of me, what did he say he would do to them? Eh? He said, the father, he said, I will be ashamed of them before the father. One thing I don't want to do when I stand before God is cry to say, I'm ashamed of you. Depart from me. I know you not. You know one thing. A life that denies Christ now, Christ will deny him. He said, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, in your name, I attend service every Sunday. In your name, I did this. What did he say he will say to them? Get away from me, ye workers of iniquity. I do not what? I do not know you. Sacrificial living. We live in an age and time that we really need to actually sacrifice our lives for Christ. He has sacrificed himself for us. He expects that we continue to live as a living sacrifice unto him. Number three, where we carry the cross is readiness to suffer for Christ's sake. And the question I want to ask is that if there is an occasion to suffer for Christ's sake, are you mentally prepared to suffer for him? It's only back money you don't have. You didn't come to church. Suffering for Christ requires that you trek from Isalioko to Sabo to attend service and trek back on that song. That is part of suffering. Suffering for Christ is to maintain your conviction. Even it will mean that you die of hunger. That's what it means to suffer. Suffering of Christ is to maintain faith under persecution. Or oh, your song, me I no go suffer. That's not a Christian song. I no go bear from that. Yeah, not begging is a part that a Christian don't do. That you will not suffer. Satan has lied to you. The Bible says that we glory in our sufferings. First Thessalonians says, don't be unsettled by any trial or suffering. You must know that you are destined for them. All this gospel that says, uh, suffer is an abnormality. No. We suffer for righteousness sake. Are you understand what I'm saying? There is a suffering for righteousness sake. I'm not saying I don't suffer as a fool. The Bible also says that. That is Peter. I said, don't suffer as a fool. Don't suffer because you are lazy. You don't work. You sleep for money tonight and you don't have money. Said, right? Suffering for righteousness. That is suffering of foolishness. Don't suffer as an offender. You went to see somebody, they are not flogging you. Say, I'm suffering for... You are suffering as a thief. Don't go and sleep with another man's wife and the husband now caught you and now remove your clothes and put it on social media. You are suffering as an adulterer. There is a suffering and there is a suffering. I'm talking about suffering from Christ, for Christ. You are a young girl. There are guys around you that forms your lifestyle and you say no. And they sleep with you because no guy will give you anything for free. Abi, Amy. Is there a free lunch? You saw you reap now. I saw iPhone. What will I reap? I will reap high you. 
But you have come to a point. No. I'm not going to live this lifestyle again. Excuse me. Your face that is yellow might not be talking, t- turning to blue and black because you can no longer afford the cream that turned your face yellow in the first place. Are you understand that, what I'm saying? In that wise, you are suffering for Christ's sake. Because you took a decision for God. I'm not going to collect money from Amy anymore. I'm not going to visit him as a single man anymore. If he wants me, he should pay my bride price. And it should be done in December. And Amy now starts funding your lifestyle. And your face that is yellow is now turning blue black. Excuse me, you glorious, gloriously rejoice. When sister in is telling you, why is your face blue black? Don't worry. It's the glory of God. It's a shade of many colors. That is suffering for righteousness sake. Are you understand what I'm saying? That is a suffering that the decision to follow Christ is what is bringing upon you. That's what I'm talking about. There are people, if you want to seek serious Christians, don't come to Lagos. Go to the north. People that will give their life to Christ and father and mother will throw them out. Say, never bear my name anymore. And they will say, I don't mind. I now have a father and a mother in Christ. I went to a place in Mina. I saw a camp of people. People that have taken decisions for God. They were in that camp. It's like a concentration camp. People that their parents are even looking for them to kill. Because they be decided to become a Christian. You are a Christian now. It's only food you don't have. You are, Lord, if you don't do it, I will, I will, I will stop serving you. Stop now. Who they beg you? Lord, if you don't do it for me next year, I will go back to the world. Come and take transport fear. I will give you. Don't even wait till next year. Go tomorrow. One way you carry cross is that you gladly suffer for the cross. Who among you here, like some people who just enter this service and carry two or three of you and say, deny Christ or you are flogged. And as you say, no, I belong to Christ. In our eyes, koro koro, they remove your clothes. You don't understand what I'm saying. They strip you naked without pants. And as we're doing it, they are flogging you from air to toe. They now put chains in your hand and throw you in is this song you'll be singing next? Eh? Is it present watch you'll be singing next? What will you do? If somebody say, Christ loves you, what will you say? I beg. Do you know what Paul and Silas did? That was exactly what they did to them. In public, they removed their clothes. Family men. They flogged them to stupor. They bound them with chains on hands and legs. And they threw them inside prison. When they recover from pain, what did the Bible say were happening? Praise and worship began in prison. The Bible said that they began to sing. They began to praise God. And God came down for them. God took delight. Look at the three sons of uh, Chedah, Meshach, and Abednego. They told the king, the fire you are setting up, we don't mind. Our God is able. He has the power to deliver us. But even if he doesn't show up, our faith will not be shaken. And the king was furious. He said, increase the fire ten times. The trouble was increased. In fact, the Bible says that those that carried them to threw them in the fire, the fire consumed them first. I'm sure that as they were entering the fire, they were so happy and delighted. I don't want to pray that your faith will not be tried. But I'm praying that when your faith is tried, you'll be able to stand. I say you'll be able to stand. In the name of Jesus. It is time we begin to build strong Christians. People that are ready to stand for Christ. People that are ready to suffer. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29. He said, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ... You should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Can somebody read that portion of the scripture for me in another version of the Bible? For you have been given into the place of the 
Is that you have been given the privilege of serving Christ? Is that not only by believing in him? Can you see that? Is it me that wrote it? So how many of you want to suffer for Christ's sake? <laughs> no hands are up. You want limousine in the name of Jesus. Let me see your hands. He said it's not just enough to believe in him. Part of the deal is that you are ready to do what? Suffer for him. This life that we have been called, it is not about bread and butter only. Are you understand what I'm saying? And when you get serious with God, Satan will afflict you with suffering. And the purpose of that suffering is to make you to deny your faith. Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, endure hardship. As what? A good soldier of Christ. Endure. Number four. Carrying the cross and living by the cross is, it means that you are able to crucify the flesh. Bearing the cross requires actively putting to death sinful behaviors and desire. Choosing to live by the spirit instead. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. It said, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passion and desires. That is, you must avoid temptation by all costs and consciously choose holiness in your thought, words, and action. You don't walk into temptation. You avoid it at all costs. You flee from every appearance of evil. You develop frame and systems around you that will limit the force of temptation around your life. Because of time as I close. Number five. One way to carry the cross is to maintain focus. Heavenly focus. Bearing the cross involves setting your minds on the things of God and eternity. Rather than being consumed by temporary earthly pursuits. And that's why most of us don't do. I look at things personally with the lens of eternity. That's why I seem to be very reckless. And I don't place value on any material things. Someone has once told me that you're a very dangerous person. You cannot be trusted with money. Not in the sense of embezzling. He said you don't have a sense of value for money. I understand with time that money is valueless. And one of the things that demonstrates the valuelessness of money is debt. Have you seen a billionaire die before? What happens to his million when he dies? In fact, the very first day a billionaire dies, the first thing people around him, where is his account number? Where is his ATM? Where is everything? Where? What people go after is his money. Even before because they begin to think, how do we bury him? A billionaire died in Ijebuye many years ago, I think during COVID. And the minute they heard that he has died, people, members of his house started looting his room. You understand what I'm saying? They started looting his room. The one that can carry ATM, carry ATM. The ones that knows where he keeps money in the compound, they started moving it. There's nothing earthly. I'm not sure the property of the man. I'm not sure there's any that is in his name till today. Other people that did not even labor for his wealth, we would have carried it. So why was the essence of living a earth-centered life? What's the essence? What's the essence of amassing wealth that when you die now, even your children might not be in the next line of inheritance? The day my father died, my father's younger sister and some of his uncle, why my mom was in the hospital, came to the house and packed all the properties away. You don't understand what I'm saying. They packed everything. We were still young. They did not mind how we are going to survive. 
the cocoa farm, hectares of cocoa farm that my father had. I was not supposed to be a brokid. Because when it comes to mechanized farming, my father was one. I was not born with clay spoon. I was born with a silver spoon. But I eventually had with clay spoon. Not even clay spoon. There was even no spoon at some point. Why? Because whoever is earthly, heavily earthly invested cannot be heavenly focused. You quoted this morning. He said, where your treasure is, dear what? Your heart will be your soul. And Jesus said, do not lay for your heart, do not lay your investment on earth where things will destroy. He said, lay your invested investment in heaven where nothing can destroy. Colossians chapter 2 Chapter 3, verse 2. It says, set your mind on things that are above and not on things on earth. As a child of God, our heart must be set on things that are above. Don't be earthly centered, but be heavenly minded. How many of you often think of the kind of life you even live in eternity? How many of you? How many of you even consider that even if we transit into eternity today, what kind of reward is waiting for me? Are you investing for that reward? Excuse me. It is double tragedy to be poor and broke on earth and still get to heaven as a broke person. Jesus told us the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Abby. When Lazarus died, where was he? The Bible says that he found himself in Abraham's bosom. That's a place of wealth and influence. He was so close to the Abraham. Many people have died before him. But I'm, I don't know how he got there. He was not at the gate of Abraham's house. He was where? In the bosom. That is... In heaven, there will be ranking and hierarchy. Are you thinking? Have you ever crossed your mind? Do you even have ambition to be anything in that eternity? If we must bear the cross of Jesus, we must be mindful of things that concerns our destiny and destination. Pray that God will grant us understanding in the name of Jesus. Lastly, living for the glory of God. Living for the glory of God. In everything, your objective, your motive, and your passion is that God gains glory through my life. And anything that will not bring glory to God, I desist from it. That is what it means to carry the cross of Jesus. And do not be deceived, I say again, many by their conduct, are living as enemies of the cross of Christ. I hope you are not one of those living as the enemies of the cross of Christ. Bow down your head this morning and begin to talk to God. One thing you want to ask God is grace to carry this cross on a daily basis. Grace to carry this cross on a daily basis. Your life is only meaningful as much and to the extent you are able to live it for Christ. A life lived for Christ is a life of meaning. A life that is not lived for Christ is a life that is useless in the sight of God. Bible says where we read, What shall it profit a man to gain the own world and lose his soul? Anyone that refuses to carry the cross of Christ is at the risk of losing his soul. Are you going to lose your soul for what we perish? Are you going to lose your soul for what will not last? Are you losing your soul for what is not permanent? What are you giving to gain? What are a portion for you in Christ Jesus? Ask God for grace this morning. The Lord, your grace to bear this cross. I told you last week that carrying the cross is not easy. It will require serious effort. But the Bible says that you should make that effort. It is a rewarding effort. Say, Lord, help me this morning. I want to live for you. I want to stay and carry my cross daily. In the name of Jesus. Help me to deny myself. 
help me to give up anything in my life uh, that is working against the cross of Christ. Help me. Help me. Help me. Say, Lord, I have counted the cost. I want to follow you. Many of you may have to abandon a way of life. Many of you may need to disconnect from some certain influences in your life. Many of you need to count as lost what you are thinking is gain to you right now. There are many of you that things are, are looking so gainful to you. But at the end of the day, it will end so painful because you have lost your soul in the process. I don't pray that you, be, you, you are part of such in the name of Jesus. Say, so, Lord, I give up. I yield myself. Lord, I'm ready to carry my cross. I'm ready to count the cost. I'm ready to follow you in the name of Jesus. Even to death. Even to death. Thank you, Heavenly Father. To be glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, I pray for your people this morning. Many words have been spoken. But Lord, I pray that that which, O oh Lord God, we bring impact upon their lives. Your spirit we establish in their spirit and soul. In the name of Jesus. Is there anyone here under the yoke of pain, under the yoke of trouble already? Anyone going through severe situation by the reason of decision he or she has taken to follow Christ. Father, I ask, oh Lord God, just like you step into the fire, Lord, for Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Father, I ask that Lord, you will step into their experience now and bring relief in the name of Jesus. Is there anyone that have made up his or her mind to follow you? Is there anyone, oh Lord God, that is saying, this life that I live, I know is not the life that I should be living. And that is saying now from today, the life that I ought to live, I want to live. The one I ought not to live, I want to give up. The grace to give up indeed. Father, Lord, bring to bear upon that person's life. Bring to bear upon his will in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. To be praised and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord just impressed something my spirit I want to announce. If you are here, you are going through a certain form of struggle. I perceive you need counsel. You know, you know that, yeah, you are under serious weight. And you want to actually want relief. And you want God to step in. I think you should see me. Uh, find time to see me either today so that I can feel as an appointment for better discussion. And uh, we can take it off from there. God bless you in Jesus.